Welcome back. Now we come to Albert Einstein. He's the only one that's going to take more than 10 minutes, but uh, not much more. But I promise you, it will be a gripping 10 minutes or so. He's fascinating. Let's dive right in, okay? Albert Einstein is considered by many the greatest astrophysicist. That's from NASA. Also, he famously said, I am not an atheist. Isn't that amazing? Right off the bat. So, obviously, he won't ever be guilty of having, if you will, atheist astroagnosis. All right? Let's look into his background and find some interesting things about him, particularly as we get to the last part of this. I can't believe that Einstein said what he said, which is wonderful, actually. It's great, but here it is. Everyone who is seriously involved in the pursuit of science, except the atheistic crew comprised of Robert Jastrow, Neil deGrasse Tyson, Stephen Hawking, Carl Sagan, and too many others, becomes convinced that a spirit is manifest in the laws of the universe. Wow. A spirit vastly superior to that of man. Hello. My God, he says, created laws. His universe is not ruled by wishful thinking, but by immutable laws. Albert Einstein. Oh, my God, you can't put it better than that. They don't teach this in school for the most part. They don't even emphasize, well, that, let alone emphasize, they don't even mention this for the most part in science classes. Albert Einstein was a devout believer in God. Okay, let's see what else he says, because it doesn't stop there. Oh, he's angry with atheists. Here's what he said. There is harmony in the cosmos which I, with my limited human mind, humble man, right, am able to recognize. Yet there are people who say there is no God. But what really makes me angry is that they quote me to support such views. Oh, oh, oh come on, man. <laughs> oh, my God. In other words, he says, uh, let's see, what is this? Something like, how does that song go? Uh, and out of your mouth, please keep my name. That's what he's saying here. He said, hey, you, you hot shots. Yeah, you know, I don't care if it's Jastro or if it's, it's Tyson or if it's uh, Carl Sagan or if it's if it's Robert Jastro. I said him. Uh, who's one? Yeah, Stephen Hawking. It doesn't matter who you are, youngsters. Keep your keep my name out of your mouth. Come talking about I, I support your views when it comes to atheism. Oh. Oh, man, I'll tell you this, uh, in, in school, college, this might be the first time you're hearing this, right? All right, man, let's keep moving here. <laughs> I just, that just cracks me up, I'm sorry. All right, Einstein used God's name Jehovah. That's interesting. I did a whole book on this. I've been studying God's name for a long time because some people say that, hey, God and Lord are his names. No, those are titles because he's called the guide of gods, meaning that there are other gods, and the Lord of lords, meaning there's other lords. Uh, but his name, Jehovah, is unique, found something like 7,000 times uh, in the Bible. I went all the way to the Soviet Union, when it was the Soviet Union, looked inside the Codex Leningrad B19A, and saw the Tetragrammaton, which is, which is the uh, representation of God's name, Jehovah. Jehovah, really, but... Jehovah is the most accepted form. All right. Now, some people ask me, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. If Jehovah is the, or Yahweh is the most, or is the accurate name of God, which you are alleging, why do you use Jehovah? Well, it's similar to what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 19 with regard to uh, putting up with a certain custom that wasn't God's original purpose insofar as marriage is concerned. Jesus said, uh, you know, such has not been the case from the beginning, but God tolerated it because of your hard-heartedness, hard is what he said. Now, 
I believe that it's obvious that God has tolerated the use of the name Jehovah, you see, because still, even though that is not the original pronunciation, that's for sure, it is the most common. So that's why I use the name Jehovah for those who know that I've written a book on it and, and done all this research for decades. All right. All right. Now let's get back here. Even Richard Dawkins, shown here, the most famous scientist, British scientist, I should say, an evolutionary biologist who was fabulously atheist, had to admit that Einstein sometimes invoked the name of God. Not only does he believe in God, he believes in that God has a name. Wow, that's amazing. The name Einstein evoked, as I stated, Jehovah. That's right, don't be afraid of it. Jehovah, that's the name he invoked. Yes, Jehovah was Einstein's personal God. But wait a minute. But wait, didn't Einstein also say he didn't believe in a personal God? Well, yes, he did. Uh, two reasons for the apparent contradiction. World War I and Edward Einstein. Let me explain. Reason number one, World War I. This is a quote. Pondering the human mutual destruction in the First World War in 1917 and citing the case of Nernst whose two sons had been killed in the fighting, Einstein asked whether Jehovah was dead. Der alte Jehovah, or Jehovah, liebt nach. My German is awful. Yeah. In fact, people have told me, <laughs> du hast einen Vogel, which means you got birds in your head. You're crazy the way you, the way you pronounce it. Anyway, aside from that, this is a quote from Einstein and the Generations of Science, 1982. You'll notice that all of these uh, quotes are here so that you can rewind this video and look at them and then check them out. See that what I'm saying is true. So that's reason number one. Reason number two, Einstein had a tragically unhappy relationship with his younger son, Edward, who was brilliant in his own right. That's him to the left there. <laughs> right, left, okay. Edward, who was often depressed, came to hate Einstein for having deserted mother and children. He reproached him fiercely. Edward sustained a breakdown in 1930, from which he never fully recovered. Einstein brooded over his guilt. Had he, obedient to the vocation of science, constructed an altar upon which to sacrifice his own son? Now, this is a quote. This is from the book, right? Uh, Einstein and the Generations of Science. It goes on to say, Jehovah had intervened to save Isaac, but no God had intervened to prevent the sacrifice of Edward Einstein. This is how Einstein himself reasoned. Uh, take a look at Genesis chapter 22, and you'll see that um, when Abraham was about to sacrifice Isaac, that God's angel, he instructed his angel to stop Abraham from doing that, you see. And there's a very interesting side point there. What do I mean? Well, it says around verse 12, 13, 14, I don't remember exactly off the top of my head, but check one of those verses out. Jehovah God said, you know, now I know that you would do what I ask you to do. Now I know that you would actually carry out my instruction to kill your son. You have faith that is outstanding. But emphasis, now I know. The obvious implication is before I didn't know. I chose not to know so that while I am indeed omniscient, Omni, Latin word for all, and science, or science, where we get our word science, which means knowledge. Although I'm all knowledgeable, I have elected not to look at you individually and know whether or not you're going to do something. That also explains the Adam and Eve saga, right? If God was um, so smart, uh, why didn't he know that Adam and Eve would sin? 
once again, he elected not to look at that. He gave them free moral agency, as is the case with Abraham. You see, and I wish someone had explained that to Einstein, you see, that Jehovah doesn't operate like that. He's a God of love, according to 1 John 4, 8. All right, let's move right along now. Jehovah was still alive and well to Einstein, just not as the personal savior he had hoped for. Therefore, Einstein downgraded him from personal God to an impersonal creator or supreme physicist. That's what he called him. Okay, you know, you, you let me down as far as Einstein was concerned. Uh, you didn't meet my expectations. I'm not going to say you don't exist because of that, because you do. I mean, you couldn't disappoint me if you weren't a real person. But instead of being my personal God that I, I, I nourish and, and holds me in his bosom, you're the impersonal creator. I'll acknowledge you as that. You're the impersonal creator. So that's what he meant when he said that he doesn't believe in a personal God didn't say he doesn't believe in God. He doesn't believe in a personal God. That cannot be overemphasized. All right? Okay. Second bullet point. This makes sense since in Einstein's mind, he could accept a supreme physicist without an emotional attachment. And all the expectations that come with the responsibilities of embracing a personal God. You see? All right. So, that's why you read where Einstein didn't believe in a personal God. Let me state that again. All right, let's move on. Einstein as a religious non-believer? That's interesting, right? Since he still possessed an unrelentless belief in a creator, the supreme physicist, but no longer embraced him on a personal level, a bewildered, disenchanted Einstein characterized himself as a religious non-believer. That's what he said himself. That's a direct quote. I'm a religious non-believer. How about that? It explains that apparent contradiction or conundrum. Okay, let's listen to the audio of rare footage of Albert Einstein lecturing in his own voice. The name of the video is Rare speech of Albert Einstein, voice of Albert Einstein. Einstein was speaking. Long title, but that's the name of it if you want to look it up. All right. Now, as he speaks, I'm going to tell you what he's saying. All right. And it's, like I said, about maybe 30, 45 seconds. So, here we go. I can see the video actually here. We are concerned here. We are concerned here with an act of humanity. With the maintaining of cultural values and at least with a measure of considerable political influence or importance, I should say. The effect upon all nations and not least upon Germans of the fate of these innocent people so maliciously persecuted must not be underestimated. To leave these victims to their misery would be a heavy blow to all those who believe in human solidarity and would encourage those who believe only in force and oppression and who act accordingly. Okay, so that's it. I apologize for having to do it that way, but at least you hear his voice and you can check out the video. Okay, all right. Let's now move on to our next video. Now, before we do that, or move on, to, I should say, to our next slide. In this slide, we're going to talk about some of the people that he felt were being persecuted and who didn't have much of a voice. And it's fascinating. Yes, he was Jewish. And it was awful how, of course, the Nazis treated Jews. That goes without saying. Now, here's the uh, thing, though. There's another oppressed people that he embraced. And here's the surprise. Here's the twist. Let's take a look. Aside from the Jews who were persecuted in Nazi Germany, who were the other people outside of Germany 
who were also persecuted and oppressed. African Americans. Yes, Einstein, in a certain sort of way, was a civil rights activist. On May 3rd, 1946, Albert Einstein visited the historical black educational institution Lincoln University, Pennsylvania, where he received an honorary degree, a doctor of laws, and of course he lectured students on the theory of relativity. Can you imagine that? Look at those uh, black young men, those students, learning the, about the theory of relativity from the master himself, Albert Einstein, who of course was Jewish. Okay, this is a, a rare, a rare photo that's never, ever shown in schools or colleges or universities, or I should say very rarely, you know, and that's why many of you may be surprised that such a photograph exists. Albert Einstein bemoaned the fact that African Americans were victimized by anti-black racisms. Yes, they were victims of anti-black racism is what I should say, okay? Incredible. It doesn't stop there, though. Here we go. Let's go to the next video. I keep saying video. Let's go to the next slide. Einstein, tea time. <laughs> During his visit to Lincoln University, Pennsylvania on May 3rd, 1946, Albert Einstein was available to have tea with the children of the mostly black faculty. Humble man. A humble man. It has been reported that he even sent uh, one of the uh, individuals, I believe it was in Harlem, an African-American young man, to college. He paid for his education. Incredible. We don't hear about these things. They don't tell us this in school. I never learned it in school. I had to do the research myself. Okay? All right. Let's move. So, what's the point of this entire presentation? This. Einstein avoided experiencing atheist astroagnosis because of his belief in God or a supreme physicist. Therefore, he had no need to see an astrophysical psychologist. Good for him. Next up, Isaac Newton. Class dismissed.